It is remembered as a generation-defining moment, the night when ships ran aground. London endured its first blackout since the Blitz, 18 people died and 15 million trees were toppled. But the devastation wrought by the Great Storm of 1987 also left in its wake a startling woodland recovery, prompting a radical reshaping of the way we work with nature to care for the countryside. Thirty years ago on Monday the storm hit southeast England after a fierce wind swooped up from the Bay of Biscay, across a corner of northern France before making landfall in the southwest and sweeping through southern England to bring the full force of its 100 mph winds to bear on the southeast. The storm did its work during the early hours of the morning, leaving behind a landscape that looked as if it had been subject to the whim of a particularly malevolent giant. It seemed as if someone had pulled a curtain to one side to reveal a formless scene that bordered upon the underworld, wrote the German writer W. G. C. Bald in his 1995 novel The Rings of Saturn. Entire tracts of woodland were pressed down flat as if they had been cornfields. For the then-home secretary Douglas Hurd, the storm had produced the most widespread night of devastation in the southeast since 1945. Ray Townsend, like most people living in the southeast at the time, vividly remembers the morning of the storm. I remember waking up at 5.30 and there was no electricity. So I looked out of the window and it was completely dark. It was quite eerie. Townsend eventually arrived at Kew Gardens where he worked, and where he is now the Arboretum Manager. The gardens at Kew had been obliterated, he recalls. The trees had gone over like dominoes. The wind had come off the river and the trees had gone down like a channel, a tunnel. Within that tunnel there was tremendous devastation. Some of the trees had been corkscrewed by the wind, like twisting the lid off a jar. A few miles away, at the National Trust's Leith Hill site, in Surrey, Paul Redsell had just settled into his new job as warden. He was woken at 6.30 by a neighbor asking for help to free a horse trapped in a stable by a fallen tree. Setting off on his motorbike to search for a working telephone, he came across trees laying on tracks and roads that were so obscured by debris that the only way of knowing where they ran was by following the raised banking on each side. Eventually making his way to the top of Leith Tower, he was able to gain a view of the new landscape. What was quite clear was that the storm had dipped in and out, there was devastation but not everywhere, there were pockets of destruction, he says. Redsell, who is now countryside manager at Leith Hill, followed what was then standard practice. After a severe storm he started to clear up. Man loves being in control, he says. It was a natural event, and at the time there was almost a sense of urgency to go out and clean up. Once we'd gone in with machines and contractors and loading bays and all the rest of it, we were causing more damage than the storm had in some places. The urge was to remove all the fallen trees and then plant new ones with little plastic tubes around them. The clearing operations removed trees that might have regenerated and compacted soil that could have provided fertile ground for wildflowers. Intervention and clearing was not practiced everywhere, however. At another National Trust site, Toys Hill, near Seven Oaks, in Kent, which lost six of its eponymous oaks, 98% of the trees fell, and while clearing work took place across much of the site, an exclusion zone was set aside to allow nature the opportunity to repair the damage itself. Emmett's Garden, Kent devastated by Great Storm of 1987 and the same area in 2007. Photograph NTPLDR Mike Howarth scores wood was left alone, says Tom Hill, the National Trust's trees and woodlands specialist. There's been no intervention at all, and it's now a thriving woodland in terms of its diversity. In nearby Nall Park, most of the trees that fell were also left benefiting fungi, plants and wildlife, while in the neighboring Emmett's Garden, where 95% of its surrounding woodland was lost, tree stumps and fallen specimens remain in the formal setting as a reminder of the storm. Hill says the storm had a profound effect on the way we care for our woodland, with an understanding that decay has a role in promoting new life, and that nature is more than capable of adapting to changed conditions, and might even need them to survive. There's a better appreciation of decay as a natural process, Hill says. Veteran trees have decay and growth happening at the same time. One of the biggest attitudes that changed was the process of decay being seen as an integrated part of life not just something dirty or rotten. Storms mix things up, they allow light to get in, which is a vital factor. Toys Hill is like a mosaic of different habitats and light and shade, and it has a very diverse structure. That's exactly what you want if you're seeking to maintain a healthy woodland. Destruction is very important, and nature is self-destructive and self-healing at the same time. Edikin, head of landscapes and horticulture at Kew Gardens Wakehurst Estate in West Sussex, where 20,000 trees were lost says the storm marked a turning point. 
It was the end of a chapter that dated back 200 years, the curation of trees knitted into ancient medieval woodland. People were disoriented, they couldn't navigate, facing three years of tidying up. But in the midst of all of that trauma, what emerged was a grand vision, a desire to do something different with the wild landscape. That something was to promote diversity and to understand that we can learn from nature how to protect woodland and to adapt to extreme natural events. It's hardwired into the ecology of some areas to have this moment of violence, says Ikin. Pre-1987 we had allowed too much of our tree stock to get to a similar age. The storm generated horizontal tornadoes, and we had created vertical planes of trees. Now we promote shelter belts of trees to buffer and filter high winds. The lessons learned are starting to bear fruit, says Ikin. 30 years gives us the first real opportunity to look at the woodland and see if it's doing what it was supposed to do. I think we're starting to achieve something extraordinary. Michael Fish's 1987 weather forecast failing to predict the hurricane. Photograph BBC The Great Storm The insurance bill was £1.8 billion, the most expensive UK weather event in the history of the insurance industry. The London Fire Brigade answered 6,000 calls in 24 hours, 3 million houses were damaged, it was the most significant storm in England since the Great Storm of 1703, which killed more than 8,000 people. Daniel Defoe described that event as the greatest, the longest in duration, the widest in extent, of all the tempests and storms that history gives any account of since the beginning of time. The highest wind gust over the UK was 100 knots 115 miles per hour, recorded at 3 a.m. on 16 October in Shoreham, West Sussex. The peak wind gust was 119 knots 136 miles per hour, recorded at Campere in northern France. The Great Storm was not officially designated as a hurricane as it did not originate in the tropics. As the storm arrived in England the Met Office warned the Ministry of Defense that military assistance might be needed to deal with the after-effects. Met Office TV weatherman Michael Fish became notorious for saying the night before the Great Storm that a hurricane was not coming. Shanklin Pier on the Isle of Wight was washed away. Cross-channel ferry the MV Hengist was driven Shore at Folkestone, the London stock market closed unexpectedly on the day of the storm. The next trading day was Monday, the 19th of October, Black Monday, when stock markets around the world crashed.